Okay, the first, uh, about the first seven and a half cha uh, chapters of Mark uh, have to do with uh, basically answering this question for us, who is this Jesus? Uh, we know that we have a historical figure named Jesus. I mean, that's well attested. Um, any uh, historian who knows anything knows that there was a man named Jesus who uh, lived in um, uh, what the Romans called Palestine uh, about 2,000 years ago. But but who is he? Um, um, and Mark addresses that, or he pulls together some stories from the life of Jesus to address that uh, in this section. Um, oops. Okay. Go away. Go away. Just a second. <laughs> Can't get rid of that. Start over here. Sorry about that. That's what they, in football, they call that a false start. Um, so who is this Jesus? Well, here in the, the latter part of chapter six, uh, beginning in the middle of verse six and running through the end of the chapter, uh, the answer is that he is God in human flesh. Jesus is God incarnate. Uh, and we're going to see as we work our way through the rest of chapter six, five ways in which Jesus is exactly like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, Yahweh, uh, the God who revealed himself to Moses through the burning bush. Um, we usually think of the Gospel of John as being the one, the gospel that really underscores the deity of Christ. And, and uh, maybe you've run into uh, uh, these folks who say, um, and actually they're pretty common in some academic circles, but there, there are people who say that uh, uh, the early Christians didn't really believe that Jesus was God, but uh, the Gospel of John, uh, you know, came along years later and uh, through John's writing and then through Paul's preaching, um, the church came to uh, proclaim Jesus as God, but they, they, these folks claim that it's not in the other Gospels. Well, that's not true. Uh, it is very much in all four Gospels. In fact, it's in every book of the New Testament, if you look carefully. Um, and um, right here in the Gospel of Mark, which is the oldest of the four Gospels, uh, we see that Jesus is, in fact, God in human flesh. So, five ways that Jesus is exactly like God. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Uh, there is no difference. Uh, they are separate persons, but there's no difference in personality between them. First of all, we see that uh, one of the things that God does, we see it throughout the Old Testament, um, and Jesus continues to do, is to partner with us. Um, and, uh, it, you know, I, I, I always kind of wonder why God does that. I mean, we see it all through the Bible. Um, you know, God creates this beautiful creation, and then he commissions Adam and Eve to spread that beauty and that love throughout the rest of creation. Um, then he calls Abraham and focuses on uh, him, reveals himself to him, uh, raises up his descendants, uh, tells them to spread this beauty and love of God throughout the world. Um, and, and, you know, you know, he keeps doing these things through human beings, when it seems to me that God could do it much more efficiently and much better um, if he just did it himself. But he doesn't. Uh, he chooses to have us partner with him. So picking up the story in chapter 6, uh, verse 6, the middle of the verse, then Jesus went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and, to, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter, well, wherever you enter a house, 
stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick, and they cured them. So a couple of things to take note of in that passage that I just read. First of all, Jesus gives them some instructions about what to take. And basically, the principle there is take only the bare minimum. It kind of reminds us of the Exodus story, doesn't it, where uh, God told the children of Israel, you know, to pack up and be ready and have your sandals on and your staff in your hand and be ready to go. Uh, don't be bogged down. Um, and that's a principle that still applies to us today because um, the, the accumulation of stuff can really nail you down. And God wants us to be ready to go anywhere uh, if he were to send us. Um, we, we, we should always, I think, be in a place where we're ready to go at a moment's notice anywhere that God wants us to go. Um, so he uh, tells them to, uh, uh, to travel light, essentially. Um, secondly, he tells them what to say. He sends them forth to expand his work. And their message is repent, which means change the way you're thinking. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is now. The kingdom of God is not pie in the sky by and by. Change the way you're thinking. That's what the word repentance means. It does not just mean to feel bad because you did things that are wrong. Uh, when we do something wrong, God has designed us to feel bad about that so that we'll bring it to him for cleansing and forgiveness and so that reconciliation can take place. But the word repentance simply means to change your mind. So the message is change the way you're thinking about what? About the kingdom of God, about what God is like and what God is doing. Uh, this is a whole new way of doing life. This is a way of loving your enemies. This is a way of forgiving those who transgress against you. This is a way of grace and unmerited favor. This is a whole new way of living. The world doesn't live this way. Politicians don't, don't get elected to office living this way. Um, kings and kingdoms don't direct their countries this way. This is a whole new way of living. It's the way of love. It's not the way of power or control or manipulation. Um, so he tells them what to bring and what to say, and then he tells them how to act. And, and again, boiling it down to the principle, he's basically saying, be, be grateful. When people welcome you into their homes, uh, be, be a grateful guest. And, and don't do anything for personal gain or for notoriety. That's not why you're there. Um, you know, this, this is not about you. This is about the kingdom of God. And then we have that phrase that is so often quoted and so often misapplied. Uh, if they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet, you know, and as a testimony against them. Uh, remember that we have no right to condemn anyone. That's God's business. That's not our business. We don't know the the ins and the outs. We don't know the motives. We don't know um, the circumstances. We don't know the all the background and the genetics and all the other factors that go into making people act the way that they act. Uh, so we we have no right to judge, and that's really what the story of the of the uh, um, tree of the knowledge of good and evil is all about. You know, with the forbidden fruit and all. Um, Adam and Eve wanted to be able to judge like God. And, and what happens when they partake of the fruit? Immediately, they start condemning and judging each other. It's not, it's not my fault. It's the woman God gave me, you know. It's, it's, it's well, the serpent made me do it. Um, there, there's there's um, disharmony that enters into the picture immediately. Um, so clearly, that's not what Jesus means. He, he's not saying condemn people. And also, we should never give up on anyone. 
Um, that's why personally, and I, I don't want to get into, um, you know, a debate about it, because, you know, you're, if you have a different opinion, I totally respect that. But personally, I'm opposed to the death penalty, um, because as long as a person is alive, they have an opportunity to turn their lives over to Christ and to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I realize that, you know, society needs to be protected from some folks. I get that. Um, but, you know, um, certainly we should never give up on anybody. And, and you know, think about that in terms of your prayers. Um, you know, maybe you have somebody you've been praying for, and maybe you've been praying for somebody for years and years, and, and you know, they, they don't seem to be getting any closer to God. Maybe they even seem to be getting further and further away. But God never gives up, so don't give up. Uh, the phrase, shake the dust off your feet, simply means to recognize when we've done all we can, and then to move on and leave the rest to God. The results are not under our control. Uh, as Mother Teresa said, God has not called me to be successful. God's called me to be faithful. So, you know, there are times in our relationships with other people, um, you know, and are, are, are reaching out for them, witnessing to them, uh, ministering to them, and so forth, when, when you've done all you can do. And if, if they just, you know, keep telling you to go away, well, you, you know, move on um, and leave the rest to God and trust God and continue to pray for them. Um, but recognize, you know, when you've done all you can, and then you've done all you can. Um, this is uh, this passage that I just read here in uh, Mark chapter 6, um, uh, along with James chapter 5, are the only two places in the New Testament where anointing with oil is mentioned. And in both cases, uh, it's mentioned in relationship to healing. Uh, James 5 says, is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord, and uh, if he's committed any sins, they'll be forgiven, and the Lord will heal him. Um, uh, oil represents the Holy Spirit. It's used frequently in the Old Testament for various things, uh, anointing kings, anointing prophets. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, these are the only two instances where it is referred to, and as I said, in both of these instances in the New Testament, it's used with respect to praying for someone to be healed. Um, and, you know, frankly, I think we ought to get back to that more, you know. Um, we, if, we're, if we're sick, we should ask the elders of the church to anoint us with oil and pray for us. That's what God said to do. I'm not saying you shouldn't go to the doctor, uh, just saying we ought to maybe also think about doing uh, what God says. <laughs> uh, secondly, Jesus is exactly like God, the God of Abraham, uh, in that sometimes, and this is a paradox, God sends us into harm's way. And so in Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 30, we have the story of the execution of John the Baptist. And, uh, you know, you know the story, but uh, just to reiterate, we have six Herods, remember, in the New Testament. There's Herod the Great. He's the one that's around at the Christmas story. Then we have um, several of his sons. He had a whole bunch of sons, but three of them are mentioned in the New Testament. You have Herod Archelaus, uh, who's the one that Joseph avoided uh, when he was coming back from Egypt, you know. Uh, he, instead of going into the region where Archelaus was, he veered to the north and went to Nazareth. And then you have Herod Antipas. That's the guy in this story. Um, he's the one that killed John the Baptist. He's the one that Jesus called a fox. Uh, he's the one who's around at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, Herod, another son of Herod the Great, is Herod Philip the Tetrarch. Uh, 
Um, he's mentioned only briefly in the New Testament. He ruled the area that would be northeast of Israel in what would be modern day Syria. And then you have a grandson of Herod the Great, and his name was Herod Agrippa I. He comes into the scene, he comes on the scene in the book of Acts. Um, he's the one who killed James. Uh, he's the one who dropped dead and was eaten by worms. And then you have his son, Agrippa II, who's the one that uh, Paul gives his defense before towards the end of the book of Acts. So seven different Herods. The one in this story uh, about John the Baptist is Herod Antipas, number three on that list there. And the whole story is one of treachery and manipulation. Um, the only um, uh, caring, loving side of the whole story is after John is executed, his disciples come and they take the body and give it a, um, a you know, a, a decent um, burial. Um, and then Jesus' apprentices come back from being sent out and they give their report to Jesus. The scripture says that the apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. Uh, do, do, do you hear that? <laughs> this is God incarnate saying, we need to rest. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. They went on retreat. Um, Jesus and his disciples resting. And we also need times of rest. We need times of silence. We need times of solitude. Uh, we need that uh, Sabbath, that Shabbat. It uh, doesn't have to be Friday night to Saturday night. You know, it's not a legalistic thing. Uh, but we do need regular times, uh, you know, built-in rhythms of rest. And yet, even though Jesus is resting, there's no sign of irritation when the crowd hunts him down and interrupts the rest. Which brings us to the next section in which we see Jesus acting exactly like God in that he cares for and protects us. We pick it up in verse 33. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. And as he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them. Notice that, you know, Jesus must have been, uh, speaking from a human point of view, he must have been exhausted. And, you know, um, normally we humans <laughs> in that kind of a situation uh, would think, oh, man, how is this, all these people found us, and there's no peace here whatsoever. Um, so. Uh, but Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Uh, he saw the people as sheep without a shepherd. He saw them as not having any godly leader, no godly king to guide them, to direct them, no shepherd to take them where they're supposed to be. Uh, when he looked at the crowd, he didn't just see a mob of people. He, he saw broken, wounded, bleeding, dying people, people that had been scattered on the hillsides uh, by the wolves that had, had uh, entered into the flock. Um, he, is, he is full of compassion, and uh, he, he never looks at people groups as just a group of people. He, he sees the group, he sees the crowd, uh, he sees the mob, um, but he simultaneously sees each individual in the crowd and sees that they, uh, he sees underneath uh, what's really, you know, what they're, what they're uh, displaying on the outside. He sees them broken and wounded and in need of a shepherd. And so, of course, you know the story about the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, uh, he, they all ate, they all were filled. Uh, and of course, you know, in the story, you know, Jesus says uh, um, to his disciples, you guys feed them. Well, we don't, we, we can't possibly do that. Well, what do you have? Well, 
five loaves and a couple of fish. Um, Jesus focuses on what we have. Even though it's little, he focuses on that. His followers are focused on what they don't have. We don't have enough here to take care of all these people. Well, what do you have? Whatever it is you have, even though it may be minuscule, even though it's just, you know, and all, all I've got is my prayers, or all I've got is the ability to send a card, or all I've got is a, is a little bit of strength to pay a visit, you know. Um, it, we, we may not have much, but that's plenty in the eyes of Jesus. He focuses on what we have, not on, and, and then he multiplies it, uh, not on what we lack. Um, there's a lot of uh, commentators who say, well, what really happened here, see, this, this really wasn't a miracle, they say. This was, um, uh, everybody had, had plenty of food, but they were all being selfish and because uh, they didn't want to share it. And then they saw this little boy who was willing to share his lunch with the whole crowd, and then they felt ashamed, and so they busted out the, you know, the, all those sandwiches that were up their sleeves and such. Um, in, in my mind, that's that's absurd. Um, that this is clearly a miracle. This is God. Uh, this is Jesus doing something that only God could possibly do. I mean, I I, I think it's ludicrous to assume or or to try to reason that five thousand men plus all the women and children, so you're looking at 15, 20,000 people, all of them had plenty of food and nobody wanted to bring it out because they were all selfish, you know, even though they're all hungry. You know, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So I believe that this was a miracle. They all ate and they were filled, the scripture says, and they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. Those who had eaten the loaves numbered 5,000 men. Now, in our uh, biblical text, depends which, which version of the Bible you're reading. Um, in, in, some of the, in most of the older versions, uh, the word that's translated man or mankind or men is a Greek word which means people, uh, male and female. Um, and, and that's, that's corrected in some of the modern versions. But the word that's used here means men. It's a specific uh, Greek word that means male human beings. And it's curious that we would be told that there were 5,000 men plus women and children, uh, as opposed to saying, you know, there were 15 or 20,000 people there. Um, it's interesting, and I'll come to that in just a moment. But before we do, and notice that we have two different banquets here in our, in our story here in Mark chapter 6. Well, we had Herod's bank, banquet, which was debaucherous, it's cruel, it's unjust, it's drunken, it's violent. And now we have Jesus' banquet, breaking of the bread and the fish and feeding 15, 20,000 people full of care, full of compassion, full of other-centeredness. What a contrast between Jesus and Herod. And, and of course, this banquet, this feeding of the 5,000, it, it brings to mind some of the other banquets that Jesus is uh, uh, putting on. You know, uh, he, he feeds... 4,000 uh, with some uh, at a, on another occasion. Um, uh, he, the Last Supper with his disciples. Um, take, take this bread, each of you, and, and, and eat it. This is my body broken for you. Drink from this cup, each of you. This is my blood shed for you. Uh, the love, the compassion, the care, and of course, the, the future reminds me to, of the future feast, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb that Revelation talks about, when, when we'll all be a part of this glorious celebratory feast uh, put on in Jesus' uh, in Jesus honor. Mm, glory. <laughs> um, the fourth thing that we see about Jesus, the fourth way that he is exactly like God the Father, 
uh, in this section of Mark's gospel is that he's beyond our comprehension. He, he, he continues to do things that only God can do. But before we get to the walking on the water, notice in chapter 6, verse 45, it says immediately, now this is right at the end of the feeding of the 5,000, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. After saying farewell to them, he went up on the mountain to pray. He brings this whole scene, this feeding of the 5,000, um, he brings it to a, um, a very abrupt end. Uh, he feeds them, um, they're celebrating, and then immediately he says to his disciples, get out of here. And then he dismisses the crowd. I mean, he does it nicely. It's not like dismissing kind of sounds like he's saying go away. But it's not that. He's just, you know, like pronouncing the benediction. It's over now, guys. Everybody go home. And then he says goodbye. And he goes up to the mountain by himself to pray. Isn't it interesting? Think about that. In, and also remember that the scripture specifically says that he fed 5,000 men plus the women and children. Why that reference to men? Well, I don't know for sure, but this area where this took place in the northern part of Israel was the heart of the uh, zealot resistance against Rome. Um, the zealots were a group of, of militant freedom fighters, underground freedom fighters, um, who, who wanted to, who were seeking to, or trying to, uh, overthrow the Roman government, not, not entirely, but to get them out of Israel and to liberate Israel. Um, it was a military resistance. And as I said, right here, this area, it was the center of that movement of zealots. Uh, the movement was started by a man whose name was Judas of Galilee. Notice Galilee, that's right where they are. Um, in the year 6 AD, and it had grown exponentially. Now, um, uh, eventually, um, the zealots were able to recruit enough people to start the Jewish wars in the 60s, um, which uh, resulted in uh, the destruction of the nation of Israel, the destruction of Jerusalem, um, and the collapse of the final fortress at, um, um, <clears throat> in 73 AD. Um, those are what's called the Jewish wars. Um, that all comes about because of the zealots. Um, so what I'm thinking here is that if we compare this also to uh, that reference in John chapter 6, it talks about people trying to take Jesus by force to be their warrior king. Here's my guess. My guess is that the 5,000 men, plus the women and children, but the 5,000 men, I'm guessing, were part of this militant resistance. Uh, I, I'm guessing they were zealots. I'm guessing that's why the whole thing is so regimented, have them sit down in groups of 50, that they were already kind of self-organized as a military force. And Jesus feeds them miraculously, and now they want to force Jesus to be their king. But what they're looking for is a militant Messiah. They're looking for a Messiah uh, who will lead them in overthrowing the Roman government. And the fact that Jesus is working miracles here, I mean, they've just been, all these thousands of people have just been fed with a handful of loaves and fishes. I, I think that they are thinking, uh, not only is our Messiah going to lead us, but he can use these miraculous powers to wipe out Rome. I mean, if he can do this, he can feed the troops as we go into battle. He can call upon Yahweh, and the, the earth can open up, 
and swallow up the Roman forces. He can call down fire from heaven like Elijah did, you know, and consume people. So they wanted to force him to be their king. I, I think that's what's going on here. Um, and because of that, Jesus very quickly dismisses the crowd uh, and sends his followers away. Why? Because he wants to protect his followers from this messianic, militaristic kind of propaganda that was in the air. And then he re tells everybody goodbye, and he retreats to the mountain to pray in order to protect himself. Because from a human point of view, um, that's, that's a hard temptation to resist. You know, you want me to be your king? You want me to lead you into battle? Okay, let's go, you know. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, yeah, what am I saying here? Um, Jesus personally dismisses the crowd to protect the follower, his followers and, and also to protect himself. I, I, I'm guessing that maybe that's what's going on here. I'm guessing that we have a whole group of zealots here, plus a lot of other people too, a lot of women and children and such. Um, and I'm guessing that this group of zealots are the ones who are trying to make him be their warrior king, and Jesus will have nothing to do with it. He's not a warrior king. He, he is a different kind of Messiah. He comes not with a sword, but with a cross. He comes not with hatred, but with love. He comes with forgiveness. He comes with grace. He conquers through loving kindness. So, he dismisses the crowd, goes off to pray, sends the disciples off in the boat. When evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And when he saw that they were straining at the oars against an adverse wind, I think maybe mentioned before that uh, the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by mountains, and uh, uh, storms come from the Mediterranean, from the side of the Mediterranean Sea, and then they, they typically gain velocity and rush down the mountainside and hit the Sea of Galilee very, very quickly and very violently. So storms can come up uh, without any notice. Um, and still today. Uh, so uh, here, here the disciples are. They're straining at the oars against an adverse wind. Notice they're trying to go into the wind. He came forward, he came toward them early in the morning, walking on the sea. He intended to pass them by. Well, that's a strange phrase, and I'll come back to that. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves. But their hearts were hardened. They had not yet understood that Jesus is God in human flesh, doing things like feeding 5,000 people with a couple of loaves and a couple of fish and walking on water, Jesus is doing things that only God could possibly do. Jesus did things only God can do. Jesus said things that only God can legitimately say. Jesus claimed to be God. Jesus accepted worship as God. And you see it all through the scriptures. And so they were utterly astounded because they didn't yet understand. Didn't yet understand. A couple of things here that struck my attention. First of all, uh, they are straining against the wind. Now, uh, several of those, you know, at least four of those disciples were professional fishermen on that particular lake. And every sailor knows what to do when you're suddenly confronted with a wind like that. You just simply turn the boat around so that the wind, and that, that's tricky, but these guys could do it, um, so that the wind is now behind you, and you put up the sail, and, and the wind pushes you right back into the shore from whence you came. But they didn't do that. They're 
trying to go against the wind. Why? And I love this about these guys. They were determined to go where Jesus told them to go. They were going to, Jesus said, go that way, and they were going to go that way, or they were going to die trying to go that way. They were not going to turn around and go back and say, oh, I'm sorry, it got too tough. We couldn't do it. They were determined to go where Jesus commanded them to go. And then they see this, what they think is a ghost, and naturally they're very freaked out. And Jesus says, it is I. The trans, that, that, that phrase, if you put it into Hebrew, is exactly the same phrase that's used in Exodus chapter 3 when Moses asked God, who was speaking to him from the burning bush, what shall I tell the people your name is? And God says, I am. It is I is equivalent to I am. Jesus is using the name of God by which God revealed himself to Moses from the burning bush. Jesus is saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. I'm the God of Israel. I'm the God of Moses. I'm the God that was in the burning bush. I'm the God that split the Dead Sea. I'm the God that led the children of Israel, your ancestors, safely through the wilderness and into the promised land. I am. I am that I am. Yahweh. Jesus, doing things only God can do, saying things only God can legitimately say. Um, things like, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Before Abraham was, I am. Things like that. Claiming to be God, accepting worship as God. Remember when after the resurrection, Thomas falls at his feet and says, my Lord and my God. Jesus doesn't say, hey, 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 no, 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 get up, get up. I'm not, I'm not God, you know. Uh, he doesn't do that. He accepts that worship. And of course, after his death, he rises from the dead. We have so much proof that Jesus is God in human flesh. Now let's come back to that verse, that strange verse in uh, chapter 6, verse 48, where it says that Jesus intended to pass them by. Uh, it reminds me of the story in Exodus 33, where, uh, you know, Moses is on the side of, of, uh, uh, of Mount, Mount Horeb, which is also called Mount Sinai. And, uh, you know, he says there was a, a, a tornado came by, but God wasn't in the wind. And a massive fire came by and God wasn't in that and so forth. Um, and then God spoke in a still small voice. And Moses, as he's communicating with God, he says, show me your glory. I, I want I want to see your goodness. I want to see your form. And God says, hey, you can't do that and live. Sorry about that. I But I will pass you by. And you can see literally the afterglow. So it reminds me of that story. It even more reminds me of uh, what Job says in chapter 9. Um, and I printed here verses 10 and 11, where Job um, is answering his so-called friends, you know. And it, it, referring to Yahweh, he says, Yahweh God does great things beyond understanding and marvelous things without number. Look. He passes by me, and I do not see him. He moves on, but I do not perceive him. When you put those references in the Old Testament together, uh, I, I think what they are saying is that, uh, and I know what Job is saying in context, is that God is so entirely other. So uh, God, God can do uh, things that far surpass our ability to even comprehend. This God is an incomprehensible God. This God is not just, you know, a human being with a lot of power, you know, a, 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 like, a, like a Superman, you know. No, this is a God that is wholly other, that is um, entirely separate from his creation. And Job even refers to God treading on the waves. 
you know, which you know fits right in with this story. Uh, and he passes by in order to reveal himself, just as God passed by Moses to reveal his glory to Moses. Um, so when it says that Jesus intended to pass him pass them by, uh, it, it sounds like. Um, and I and I guess I under, from what I understand, it's a hard passage to to translate. Um, but it, it's it sounds like um, Jesus was planning on just walking on by and meeting him on the other side without saying anything. Uh, but I think in context, what it's what he's really saying or what's really happening is that he he is uh, coming, treading on the waves, intending to show them in a deeper, fuller, richer way than they've ever seen before, who he is, God incarnate, Yahweh in human flesh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. This is the true and the living God revealing himself to his disciples. And then finally, we see Jesus acting exactly like God the Father. You want to know what God's like? Look at Jesus. Both of them focus on those in need. And that's the way the chapter comes to a conclusion. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and moored the boat. And when they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into villages and cities and farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. Oh, Father, I thank you so much that you are a God of love, that you are a God of compassion, that you are a God of grace, that you look upon us not with condemnation, not with criticism, not with judgment, but with loving kindness and mercy. You see our struggles and our weaknesses, those times of sadness, those times of uh, confusion, those times of difficulty. You see us as sheep in need of a shepherd. Oh, Father, thank you for being our shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd, and therefore we shall not want. Lord, we're so grateful to you. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. As we go into uh, discussion groups, if you're able to stay with us, I know a couple of you have to go, and we love you, and we'll see you next time. But um, if you can stay with us, we break up into uh, a couple of discussion groups, and um, just some things to get you started in talking with each other. Um, can you think of some historical examples of um, messianic militarism when people were looking for a militaristic messiah figure? Uh, when they were uh, in history, this has happened more than once. So um, that might be something you can explore. I know uh, David loves history, so um, might want to jump into that one. And and another question, you know, thinking about uh, John the Baptist especially, but why is it that God would put his beloved children in harm's way? And And, you know, Jesus really did that when he sent his disciples out two by two. I mean, on this trip that we studied about today, they didn't seem to have any trouble, but eventually they all did, um, and, you know, in, historically. So uh, why, why is that, do you think? Um, so those are some things that you can think about and uh, uh, talk about with others.